Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Margaret Alkek uh, Williams Dance Lab for our second dance talks happening in this facility. Uh, my name is Connor Walsh. I'm a principal dancer with the Houston Ballet. Uh, and I'm very honored to be here with our guest. Our guest this evening is commonly believed to be one of the last New York City Ballet ballerinas to have been entirely trained and developed under George Balanc Balanchine's active tutelage. She joined New York City Ballet at the age of 16 in 1967, was promoted to soloist in 1974, and principal in 1977. During her 31-year career, she danced ballets such as Four Temperaments, Square Dance, Who Cares, Emeralds, Diamonds, from the evening, uh, full-length evening, Jewels, Theme and Variations, Rec Room Canticles, Dances at a Gathering, and many, many more. I'm sure I could spend the whole hour <laughs> yeah. listing ballets. In 1977, Balanchine choreographed Ballo della Regina and later Ballade. She has featured in many PBS recordings for Dance in America and was the co-author and co-artistic director of the Balanchine Essays. In 1984, she wrote an autobiography called Dancing for Balanchine. In 1987, she also received the Dance Magazine Award. Since retiring in 1997, she has been traveling the world, staging and coaching Balanchine's work. Please. Um, Welcome, Merle Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, first I'll say it is, it's a real honor um, to be sharing the stage with you, something I never thought would happen. So um, thank you for being here on behalf of Houston Ballet, on behalf of uh, the Houston audience. It's a real privilege. Well, it's a privilege for me to be here, too. I have to tell you, I, I've said this today several times, but it's one of my favorite places to come to work. And it, I'm not the only one. There are many balancing repetitors. We, we get together and say, oh, we're going to Houston. <gasps> Aren't you lucky? Yes. And they say, we are, we're so happy. It's one of our favorite places to work. So we, I'm very happy to be here. Oh, we're glad to hear that. Um, well, and forgive me if my nerves catch up on me. This is my first time in this sort of position as the moderator. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to, to speaking with you. And uh, I, I would imagine, please forgive Meryl, who has just got off a plane from Tokyo yeah, I'm uh, a last jet night. Lag, but <laughs> so, so hopefully I will try and keep her interest. <laughs> yeah, if I yawn, it's not the company. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll start where most stories start in the beginning. You were born in St. Paul, Minnesota, and raised in Rutland, Vermont. Um, could you take us to the beginning, your first impressions of ballet, and sort of how this journey began? Well, when I was living in Minnesota, uh, my older sister, who's about three years older than I am, was taking ballet class, and my mother brought me to, you know, when she went to pick her up, and I was with her. I was about five, and uh, I saw this ballet class, and there was a pile of coats in the middle of the room, and they were, the students were being asked to jump over it, like they were leaves, and jump, and I, I wanted to do that so badly. <laughs> and um, so I said, I wanted to take ballet. And the school said, no, you have to be eight. You can't, you can't start. And I was crushed. So we moved to Vermont when I was seven. And the first thing I said I wanted to do was take ballet. Well, there wasn't really a good ballet school in Rutland, Vermont. <laughs> but, um, but I did start. And um, it was not the best training, but I loved it. And I just never changed my mind about what I wanted to do. There's a lot of music in your family as well, yeah? Well, my parents liked the arts. I mean, none of them uh, were artists in reality, you know, uh, but they went to the symphony a lot. They brought my sister and I to, to see performances of ballet and music and went to museums. I mean, they were very arts oriented in that sense. They loved the arts. So I was exposed to that very early. Mm -hmm. And so it was part of my life in that sense. Sure, sure. Um, your father recalls uh, in, when you witness your first ballet class, a tremendous alertness at the studio. She could hardly retain herself from joining. She just wanted to be a part of the other children jumping and leaping I, about. I did, I did. And I don't know, you know, it wasn't really a lot of ballet. It wasn't tendus and, <laughs> yeah. and all the classroom type of things. But it just looked like, I think I liked this, uh, this image of jumping over the coats. And then I'd been to the ballet. and. You know, the costumes and the scenery and the music and all that, I liked it. I, th I thought that was just great. And that, so I made up my mind, and I never changed my mind. <laughs> yeah. So eventually, uh, 
you went and auditioned for School of American Ballet Theatre? Well, or School I, of American Ballet, excuse I, me. What happened was, I was, when we were living in Vermont, my parents would take um, us to the New York City for the weekend, and they would always try and have me take a ballet class there somehow. And all the teachers, no matter where I went, said, your daughter's talented, but if she's serious about this, she needs better training. She's not getting good training. And right around that time, the Ford Foundation gave a big grant to the School of American Ballet. And that somehow influenced my mother. One, it told her what school I should go to. <laughs> <laughs> and two, I think it made her think um, that maybe ballet was uh, going to be a viable thing to do. Mm -hmm. And way back then, it was not so respectable, you know? Yeah. Their daughter in the theater, ugh, yeah. they weren't so happy about that. Uh, to be a pianist would have been okay, but a dancer, I think they were not so thrilled. But I was determined, and they saw that I was determined. And mm -hmm. so um, they then took me to the school, and I auditioned, and, um, and that was the beginning. Sure, sure. Um, your mother recalls a meeting with your school director hmm. that I will quote. And I, just for any young dancers or parents of dancers, I just found this so amusing that I had to share. <laughs> Um, it says, um, the director of the school said to Merle's mother, I'm sorry to have to tell you, Miss Merle, but your daughter shows the potential of being an extraordinarily fine dancer. <laughs> and she said, these things change, of course. <laughs> yeah. We can't predict the future, but there it is. I just think that's great. You know, obviously, you're signing up for something that's extremely challenging, right. but extremely rewarding. Yeah. Um, I, I, but I think my parents did, oh dear. <laughs> now we have, <laughs> you know, because we were still in Vermont, and how, how was I going to find a way to live in New York mm -hmm. and get training when we didn't live in New York? And Vermont was really not going to be the place to, to uh, study ballet. So, yeah. so it presented my parents with a huge dilemma. That's great. So you eventually were, you were accepted to School of American Ballet, and you went. Well, what, was, what was your initial impression? I, oh, well, I, first of all, I loved having class every day. Yeah. But I had these Russian teachers that I could barely understand. They, their English was so heavily <laughs> accented. <laughs> I had, I've had similar experiences. And, I, I just, and also, I had never been taught the names of steps. Right. And they would say, you know, three tondas quasi front. What's quasi? I, I never heard of what quasi was. If I say I didn't know the difference, and I, I, I was totally lost between their accents and not knowing the names of the steps. Um, that was a big challenge. But on the other hand, I, it was, it was, I felt like I was in paradise doing what I wanted to do. Um, and I just, I just wanted more. I just, it was just unbelievable. And I, I, my parents were, I, I, I really bless them. I mean, the first time I went to New York, they had to get me out of academic school. They brought my grandparents from Indiana to stay with me. My parents stayed in Vermont, and I was there in New York for three months, and they figured out how to get me out of school and pass my tests and, you know, and send me to New York. At that time, I was 12. And then I went to live in New York alone with a, I mean, not alone alone, but without my parents, without my family, at 13, and lived with a woman I'd never met, my parents had never met her. And I don't know how my parents had the courage to do that at 13 when I was, but I was very independent-minded, and I'd been to New York a lot, and I liked New York, I wasn't afraid of New York. I, you know, and I was passionate, I wanted to do this, mm. and they kind of gulped very hard, <laughs> <laughs> sent me off. Uh, you know, I, I think that was probably it, because everyone, who has worked with you and your, all of your early teachers and classmates recall you having a very strong work ethic, yeah. ethic in the early times. So I can only imagine that your parents noticed that early on, that this is something you clearly yes, want. Yes, I think, I think without that clear, clear input from me, that this is, you know, I loved it, I wanted it, I needed it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they tried to make it a reality, and they yeah. did. At, at SAB, you, you were fortunate enough to have some wonderful, wonderful teachers. One oh. that is very well known around the United States is Stanley Williams. Um, you also had some wonderful classmates, such as Colin Neary and Gelsey Kirkland. Yes. So <laughs> I, I can only imagine the sort of influence that must have, have been all of a sudden entering you know, this, this place that is becoming the mecca of dance, having classmates that are so extremely talented. Um, plus, plus dancers, principal dancers from New York City Ballet would come take class. Exactly. So, you know, it was, it was, 
it was impressive and made me feel pretty humble and weak. Because <laughs> I was starting over. I was, not, I was not technically adept at all. Yeah. Well, clearly you changed that. <laughs> that work ethic got <laughs> yeah. helped. So at the age of 16, um, Balanchine invited you to join the company. Um, that's quite a young age. I don't know if many of you know. I, commonly, people join the company around 18. Yeah. after high school. Um, you invite somebody at 16 when they show extreme promise and I imagine work ethic as well. At the time you were the youngest member of the company. What was that like all of a sudden entering, you know, you have just moved to New York, you're in the school and all of a sudden you're the youngest child in this company of professionals. Well, it was a bit overwhelming <laughs> um, and I, I was very thin, not because I had an eating problem. I ate everything, but I was just really thin, and a lot of the core girls were not very happy to see this really <laughs> thin girl come in. <laughs> and they gave me a bit of a hard time. Um, and also, I was very weak. I really, um, I don't think I was really ready to join the company. But Balanchine liked to take people when they were young and mold them hmm. and influence them early, because it's easier to put the right thing in early rather than having to undo everything and then re relearn it a different way. Um, and there had been people that joined the company at 14, so it wasn't as wow. if it wasn't a shock, you know. I mean, 16 at that time was kind of, it happened frequently. It, wasn't, right. it was not that unusual. And I'm sure you know, another shock that it must have been was all the performances that you were doing. I mean, in, in New York City Ballet, we'll talk a lot more about this as the night goes on. Um, we talked a little bit about it with Edward Liang last night when Stanton was here. Um, City Ballet performs a lot in a week. They do a lot of different shows. Um, it, tell we, us what was that, that did, was like adjusting eight, eight to that. We did performances a week and that was a three month season. You know? right. and, and so, you know, one day off a week, it, it's hard. And I got injured right away. I was not very smart about warming up properly, you know. I knew, I knew what to do, but I, it was, I'd been rehearsing all day. I kind of thought, why do I need to warm up? Hmm. And I should have warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it was, I mean, it was overwhelming, and Balanchine's class was overwhelming, uh, but, but it was also, you know, I was, I was just learning all day long, it's like, yeah. and watch, what I had to watch, the people I had to watch, Viola Verdi, Melissa Hayden, Patty McBride, Suzanne Farrell, Allegra Kent, I mean, it was, it was a miraculous time, I, I mean, just, imagine. you could just soak it in just no matter where you were. Sure. Do, do you think you could speak a little bit about Balanchine's classes? I mean, I've heard they were extremely challenging, but they were integral to, you know, what he did at the company. Um, and there's a quote, I wish I had it, uh, that's something about he will probably be remembered as a teacher he rather than a choreographer. Yeah, he said that someday he would be remembered more for his teaching than his choreography, which really says something because yeah. he knew he was a good <laughs> choreographer. <laughs> But he, in a funny way at heart, I feel he was, he was a teacher. Um, I mean, that was all day long. He was teaching us. He was encouraging us. He was more than anybody I've ever worked with. I mean, he was just, his ballets were choreographed almost to give you a challenge, you know, to work on the things that you were weak at, mm -hmm. and yet also give you some things that you were strong at. So you could, you were forced to work on it. He knew you'd work on it if you had a ballet <laughs> you had to do in front of an audience. Um, but, but it would be a way that was a little more enjoyable and fun. And, but his classes were unbelievably challenging. Uh, the number of repetitions of a step were extreme. And the speed that we had to do things at was extreme. I mean, we, I don't know how many tundus you would say would be a lot in one <laughs> direction. We would, 16 was not many. Mm -hmm. We would usually do 32 front, 32 side, 32 back. Some days it was 64. And fast. Extreme for anyone who doesn't <laughs> take ballet that's, class. That's yet. extreme. This right? is your warm up. You yeah. Know. And it would get, it would start really slowly, and by the end it was, I want two, three, four, five, and 30, and, you know, and you were, you were just dying. Your muscles were just burning. And, but, that, but it gave you such stamina, and the way he insisted you work on it, it gave you such quality of ref, refined movement. Mm -hmm. um, and his steps in the center, he would, take a, he would have a theme, like changement or glissade, and he'd build a whole class around that. And you would do it every tempo, every um, 
you know, in three, in four, in two, in five, and <laughs> around, and up and forward and back, and, and all these various rhythms. And it was fun to see what a glissade could become. That's great. <laughs> you know? in, uh, in 1973, after you've been in the company for a few, few years, Balanchine created two solos on you. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what those were and what that was like, finally working close up with, with Balanchine? It was nerve-wracking, that's <laughs> what it was. <laughs> um, the first one was a solo in Cortege en Gois, uh, which was a, a, um, a ballet that he choreographed really for the retirement of Melissa Hayden, but he put two solos in it for, his, for me and Colleen Neary. Um, and he gave me devilish steps. He, by then, he, he knew that I w had gained a lot of technical proficiency, and he was just, he loved to push people to mm. see what more they could do, and so it was very awkward and tricky. Um, and then the next one he did was in Capella, that he did um, the Dawn solo for me, which was a little more uh, fluid and normal. <laughs> it was hard, <laughs> but it was, it was hard. <laughs> um, but it was, but he, it made me see what it was like when he was choreographing, you know, well, dear, do you like this leg or that leg? And well, you know, I mean, he wasn't, it was like a working the two of us together. It wasn't like, you have to do this and ordering me around. It mm -hmm. was, you know, well, come over here, dear. dear. Where do you want to start, dear? <laughs> there or there? How nice, you know, it, yeah. was, it was, it was a joint effort. That's great. Also around that time, you started working with Jacques Dembois with his uh, the side company, would you yeah, say? Could he, you explain went, that a bit? Yeah, he, um, when I was about 18, Jacques used to do lecture demonstrations around. The company had big chunks of time off and the dancers aren't paid when there's no work. So he had, he had a family and he, he would put together a little group of dancers and he liked to take some of the younger ones and one, he didn't have to pay us as much. <laughs> but um, it also was an opportunity to, for us to do ballets that we wouldn't have a chance to do otherwise. So right. he really um, was very helpful in helping explain what Balanchine wanted and to help me learn to be partnered. Because in ballet school, we had partnering class, but it wasn't very good. And I was always, because I was so skinny, I was always given to the weakest guy. <laughs> It didn't help me very much. Yeah. <laughs> so. In 1969, Suzanne Farrell left New York City Ballet. Um, that did a few things. It, <laughs> one, it opened up a lot of repertoire yes. for, for young dancers to do. Um, you were fortunate enough to gain some of those roles in theme and variations and diamonds. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that time period and all of a sudden starting to do much more principal work? and. Well, Suzanne Farrell was Balanchine's muse at that time, and uh, she kind of gave him an ultimatum at one point about a certain situation, and he finally, he had up to that point, he w basically gave her anything she wanted, but this one was, rubbed him the wrong way, and he said, no, dear, you know, I'm not gonna do what you want, and she had, she had said, I'm gonna leave if you don't give what, give me what I want. And he said, goodbye. <laughs> so she left, but he was devastated. He was really devastated. And um, he kind of went into hibernation a little bit. But when he came out of hibernation, um, he started looking at everybody. And he really started working with a lot of the younger dancers, one of whom was me. And he had, you know, he had to fill these roles. and. A lot of the principal dancers at a certain point, for whatever reason, were injured or unavailable or, you know, and I started doing some of these big roles when I was still in the court of ballet. I mean, I did, I did Ballet Imperial, which is one of the hardest roles there is when I was in the court of ballet. And I did Diamonds, and I did Theme and Variations. I mean, those are like the, uh, one critic in, uh, Arlene Croce in The New Yorker called them the gut crunchers. <laughs> <laughs> And they are. A any of our ballerinas will tell you these are some of the they most are challenging some of the ballets. hardest ballets he ever created, and, uh, and there I was at the core trying trying to do these ballets. And uh, but it it meant that he was there helping me a lot, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and and when he, as I say, when he came out of this kind of hibernation, it was a very fertile time for him. It was like 
he had missed choreographing. And, and there he had all these dancers, and they were young, and they were interesting, and what can I do? And it just, you know, it was a great, great time. That's exciting. Yeah. Also around that time, you started dancing some more Jerome Robbins work. Mm -hmm. um, we also will be doing a Robbins piece, the concert coming up. Um, I think Dances at the Gathering was also one of those. What was he like to work with as far as, you know, maybe in comparison to Balanchine or? Well, that's a big. <laughs> uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> I mean, Balanchine was always a gentleman. He was quiet. He didn't raise his voice. He was, cons he was considerate of you in many ways. He was concerned about, you know, where you're injured. You know, he, he was. He was Wonderful to work for. He was demanding, but he was wonderful. Jerry Robbins was one of the most, he's renowned. I mean, I'm not telling anything the world doesn't know. He was very <laughs> difficult to work with. And he could make you feel about this big in about five seconds. You know, he'd be rehearsing. He, first of all, he wouldn't cast it. He'd have, he'd teach about 10 people the same role. And then one day, he'd be rehearsing one, well, baby, you've lost it. Uh, hey, you, over there. He wouldn't know your name. And then you do it, now you don't have, hey baby, come back, you lost it, come on. And he, was, he was just, it was not nice. And, and he would, dances at a gathering, uh, he had everybody switching roles and he practically didn't tell the people until the night before the performance which roles they were doing. I mean, it was just really difficult mm. and upset, it, you know, he, he did not have a, he was not well loved as a person to work with. We admire his ballets and, and he could draw a lot out of you, and I learned a lot from Jerry, and we all did, I think, but the, the process was not always so pleasant. <laughs> yes. Yep, um, Bart Cook will be coming here recently, uh, or excuse me, soon, to um, stage the concert, and he worked very close with Robbins as well. I'm sure he'll have some interesting yes. stories. Um, we'll, they'll be doing a dance talks with him as well. Um, so we move forward a little bit, and. All of a sudden, after you've started doing all of these principal roles and you showed you could handle them, you've been, and then you got promoted to soloist um, in 1974. Still only 21 years old. I mean, yeah. very young yeah. to be a soloist. Something also happened around this time period, um, or should I say someone? <laughs> yes, <laughs> something, someone. <laughs> is, there, is there, do you know what I'm talking about? And I is there a story? Well, I was um, walking down the street one day, and I was going to have dinner with my sister, and I, walk, I was walking along the street, and suddenly there was this guy behind me who kind of pulled in front of me. And he, the reason I noticed it was he was wearing a leather jacket, and it was raining out. I had just bought this new leather jacket, and he was wearing one too, and I thought, it's getting wet, and I, how am I going to protect my new leather jacket? So I saw this guy in front of me, and then suddenly he was behind me, and then he was in front of me. And then he was like, what's this guy doing? What, you know? And then we got stuck at a light, and he said, you're with New York City Ballet, aren't you? And I said, yes. I was like this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he said, I, I, I know I recognize you. I don't know your name, but um, I you know, I, I really would love to know what it's like to be a dancer, and I love New York City Ballet, and, and meanwhile, we were walking, you know, and finally, he said, what, you know, can I take you out to dinner? And I was like, I don't know if I should say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> but he intrigued me, and so I said yes, and anyway, um, we ended up going out, and I, who had been a, just this shy, wee little mouse, you know, wouldn't say anything, I was like this all night long. <laughs> And I was relaxed. So this was the man I ended up marrying, Kibby Fitzpatrick. <laughs> and uh, he became very instrumental in my career. Um, he actually didn't like my dancing very much. He thought, he didn't know ballet technique, so he couldn't appreciate that what I was doing was hard or good or anything. He thought my upper body and my face were frozen and stiff and unappealing. And he didn't dare tell me that. It's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> and we went out one night on vacation. We went on vacation, and there was music playing, and I got up and I started dancing. And he was kind of looking. He was kind of looking at me. He just sort of, sort of stopped moving and started looking at me. I said, "What's the matter?" He said, "You look great. Why can't you look like that on the stage?" <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Your face is changing, and you're all relaxed, and you know, you look you you look wonderful." 
So that was, uh, you know, it was kind of a jolt, but, but he said it in a way that was very constructive. And then he started coming, he came to practically every performance I ever did, once, once we got together. And he would sit in the audience, and he, w he became sort of a coach. Because Balanchine wouldn't talk about what my face was doing. He hated talking about that. So I'd go home. Uh, we'd go home, and he, he'd taken little notes in the dark. <laughs> try, well, you know this entrance where you do this funny thing? And I'd say, yeah, I kind of know. <laughs> and he'd say, well, this is awkward, and, but that was really good. And well, you're not looking. You're only looking over here. You need to look at the audience over here. I mean, he would say things that somebody, as a general audience member, felt. Right. And that was something I wasn't, that was the kind of information I wasn't getting. And was that challenging to, to receive from a non-dancer? I imagine at first that must have been well, extremely. It, it was a little, it was a little jarring. And yet I thought, well, it makes sense. What you're saying <laughs> makes sense. And if you say I'm looking bad, that I just soon know mm -hmm. what to work on. If it's funny, I want to fix it. So. Yeah, okay. we get so, so sort of wrapped up in the dance world and we get obsessed about the things that dancers, only dancers are really obsessed about. Um, so I think that it's really interesting that you were open enough to allow somebody else's perspective, um, bring in somebody else's opinion, uh, somebody who is outside of the dance world. And I imagine that that was extremely helpful in the it, end. It really was. And I, that, from the minute, I shouldn't say the minute I met him, but that was right at the period where my career just suddenly went like this. Right. It just took off. Um, and so I really, I really do think that his input was invaluable. So going forward a little bit, I just want to talk more about, for dancers who are now approaching Balanchine's work, um, who don't have the opportunity to, to ever work with him, you know? Um, what, I've also heard there's a lot of variations. There's times when Balanchine was extremely particular, but then there's also times where he was very not particular, and there was a lot of freedom. I, to, to try and, as a dancer now, you're always trying to do exactly what Balanchine wanted. Perhaps you could give you know, myself and other dancers in the audience some advice of what really was important to Balanchine. What, yeah. Well, that's, that's a big, hard question. It's um, sort of broad, but it, well, <laughs> sorry. It, there, there's so many aspects to it. And, um, it's certainly it, his freedom of, you know, allowing us things makes it hard when you stage a ballet because you don't know which version you're supposed right. to teach. Um, I think, first of all, I, there, were, um, there were a lot of technical things. The musicality, first of all, paying attention to the music, being with the music, responding to the music was first and foremost. Um, the, the, the refinement of, of the turnout and the, the um, attention to the in-between steps, how you put your foot on the floor, how you, to make those transition steps as important as the, the big flashy steps. Uh, port de bras was, um, you could often choose what arms you wanted to do, but the manner you used them was, right. was fairly clearly delineated. Um, lots of plie, lots of apron and covering space. I mean, just move big and always go, sort of always going beyond yourself. He was mm. always pushing us in general to, to move bigger. Yeah, somebody was always saying more and more, more and more and more. More yeah. plie, longer step, you know, do it faster, do it, you know, jump from there to there, not jump this way, you know, I right. don't know. It was, it was always pushing us. Um, how to know what's right, it, it's, it's this fullness of it. The bending, of, a lot of bending, a lot of, um, a lot of broad movement, mm. uh, and, the, and the great precision of positions and, and where your, your body is going. He made modifications in port bras because he used speed so much, and you can't move fast when your arms are out here. So he, he brought them closer to the body. Right. And that's something that's unfamiliar to a lot of people, but is not, it's still the same form. It goes over here, and it, because it's going so fast, you don't, you don't, or your elbow bends maybe a little more, depending on the speed. But you don't see this so much. So you, you get to a fast position. Right. Um, and that helps, from a technique point of view, that, that helps a lot. Um, so 
I don't know, it's hard to generalize. Absolutely. Well, uh, but there were, you know, there definitely were times where you'd, you'd maybe have a tricky, t he'd do a variation for it, like Patricia McBride, who he said could turn like the wind. So he gave her all these pirouettes, all these odd combinations, and then the next person would come to do it, and they didn't have that same facility. So he'd change the step. It would still be a turn, but it would be something different. Mm. And I think, from at least from my point of view, there are times when a step just doesn't suit a specific dancer. It just doesn't work. It's, their proportions are wrong, or they, they just, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't work. And he used to change the step. However, there, there are also um, ballets like Apollo, where there are, there are iconic steps in the, in the ballet, and you just can't change them. You, you have to do some of those. But um, so that leaves, it's, it's, again, it makes it hard to, there's no cut and dried rule about what you can change and what you can't. You mm -hmm. have to have uh, well, clearly you, you artistic found, <laughs> Clearly you found what Balanchine judgment. was looking for because in 1977 he promoted you to principal. Um, also, that same day you also found out that he would be choreographing Ballet della Regina on you. What was that, choreographing that ballet like? What was the process? What was, you know, for your first full ballet choreographed specifically on you? Well, again, I was nervous. I, I really wanted, you know, he's doing a ballet, first full ballet, and I wanted it to be a, to feel like I could live up to whatever he gave me to do and that it would become a ballet that would stay in the repertoire and be one that people liked. And um, I was really nervous. Um, and I also was not in great shape. I had, you know, it's so weird. I was this miss, miss you know, always in shape and always ready to go, but it had been such a hard season and we only had, I don't know, a week or 10 days off. And I was never used at the beginning of rehearsal period. It was always the court of ballet or something, you know, and so I, I thought it's okay if I go back not perfectly in shape. <laughs> and then I was swimming, I was in Bermuda and I scraped my knuckles on coral. So I didn't even want to put a toe shoe on. <laughs> And then I could go back and find out, oh, the next day you're going to start this new ballet, <laughs> which he told me was going to be a virtuoso ballet. And I thought, oh, no. If he says that, now he's really going to push me. I'm going to, it's going to be really hard. And it was. But it was also, again, it was this kind of, he, he was so un, pre, I don't even know the word. I just, he just casually walked in the room. and. He'd kind of chat, and then he'd go to the piano, and he'd talk to the pianist a little bit. And, well, dear, where do you want to come in? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, where do you, wherever you want me to come in, I don't know. You know, and, and then it was, but again, it was just kind of quiet, and well, what if you do this, dear? It was like, you know, just a little conversation. Would you like to do this and that? Well, let me, let me see. Okay, next, and then he just, it was, you know, and he choreographed so fast. That the, was the hard thing, was to try and remember it. Mm. And it was also fiendish. And, you know, um, he choreographed Balo in a week. Week. Was he generally somebody who came into the studio prepared? He, or? he was prepared by knowing the music, right. inside out. He wrote the piano score. Okay. He reduced the, the orchestral score to a piano score. Wow. Um, so he knew the music. <laughs> And he had pretty much decided, you know, what, what music would be for the core and what, where there were solos and where the principals came in and out. And he, that he had pretty well structured, but he didn't have any steps, uh, specific steps. However, we'd been doing hops on point in class. And I kept thinking, why are we doing hops on point in class? He never gives hops on point. Well. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now you know why, and now I, then I knew why. Um, so it was kind of a, he used class sometimes as a laboratory to see what people did well or what he, what kind of combinations of steps he could do. So he, he put a lot of that in Balo. Um, but he started with the pas de deux, and you know from the, from doing it, mm -hmm. it's not the most sensational pas de deux. Mm. And it's very quiet and delicate, and I was like, oh, this is not going to be a good ballet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm failing him. I was I, I went home and I Kibby said, "Well, how was Alan? I, I don't think it's going to be very good." I said, "I was like, I'm really worried." Oh no! Yeah, I was I was worried. Well, clearly, it turned out to be spectacular because it's gone on to have quite a life um, beyond its premiere. 
which it must be feel like a yeah, nice it's compliment. very satisfying, and it's very. Um, I mean, I love doing Barlow. It was a challenge. It was a huge challenge, but I loved it. He gave me everything I could do well, everything. Mm. And then when he did the next ballet, <laughs> he gave me everything I couldn't do well. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> so you, throughout your career, also you um, you seem to struggle with a few different injuries. How did uh -huh. that sort of um, affect you, and what did you learn from that process of, of going off and coming back? And it, I mean, it clearly didn't slow you down. It did slow me down. Well, you, you danced with the company I, I had, for 31 years. So yeah, was, yeah, I hate to <laughs> think how many of those were injured. <laughs> um, I, I, I had several really bad injuries. Right. Um, and often they came at really inopportune moments. Um, but what I ended up finding, for, and I don't really know why, was that when I came back, I was a better dancer than when I stopped. Um, Either I got rid of some bad habits, or, you know, you have to retrain everything all over again, and so I tried to clean up some of the bad habits. Right. Um, I think, I think um, watching performances, going out front and watching, and seeing what, what impression, you know, as you say, dancers get all caught up in the, the little tiny little right. technical things, and you think that's all that matters, and you go out front and it doesn't, that's, it matters. Right. But it's not the most important thing. To see what your husband was seeing in a yeah. way. Yeah. And, and also I found that by sitting there, I, I saw what I liked people doing in certain roles and what I didn't like certain people doing. And it gave me ideas about how I would want to do those roles if and when I got back in shape. <laughs> and suddenly that visualization helped my dancing a lot. And right. I think, like anything, life's experiences add add depth to, to what you project on stage. You have more feelings, the, the suffering, the pain, the anger, the frustration, all those things add up and they can come out on stage in other ways, make, make you more expressive and respond to music and the steps in different ways that are more interesting. Right. Later um, in 1980, Balanchine decided to choreograph another ballet on you, Ballade. Um, could you tell us a little bit about this? I, I believe he had just come back from being very ill. Is he that had, correct? Yeah, he had just had bypass surgery. Okay. And it was the first ballet he choreographed when he came back. And um, I was very flattered that it was for me. You know, I was st stunned, really. Um, and this ballet was much a much more lyrical ballet. It was, but it was kind of an oxymoron because it was so fast, and it's really hard to be lyrical when you're moving fast. <laughs> um, uh, but that's what it was. It was it was very lyrical. But I, oh, it, it was the hardest. I mean, you look at Balo and you think, now that's not going to get much harder than Balo. Ballad was harder. Wow. It was harder, and it, I didn't understand it. It was it was um, kind of a mysterious mood, and a, I don't know. It was kind of Proustian, <laughs> is what I've come up with. <laughs> I, you know, it was just me like memories and episodes and. Um, but I didn't quite get it, and I. Uh, and to this I, day. Well, I understand it much more now, mm. but I kept being injured, and, and he wouldn't put it on unless I did it, and so the ballet didn't go very much, and I never did it very much, and then finally I was too injured. I, I you know, I couldn't do it anymore because it was so hard. I couldn't do it. Right. And, um, but I, when I've seen other. It hasn't gone very much in New York City Ballet either, but when I've seen it or tried to teach it, I oh, I get it now. I get it. Right. But it was, I needed to kind of sit back and see it. You know, and when you dance, mm -hmm. you don't see it. <laughs> you know, you speak about when, when Suzanne Farrell left the company that opened up roles, or when you were injured, the balance sheet didn't do the ballet. It, was that typically how it was that this ballet was this person's, and there yes. wasn't a lot of rotation? There wasn't a lot of rotation. When he did a new ballet, there was almost never an understudy. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, which put a lot of pressure on, on you as the person doing the ballet, yeah. or, um, you know, there were times when if somebody was injured, somebody would have to learn it fast and go on, but this particular, at this point in time, he didn't want Balad, he didn't want anybody else doing Balad. Right. Um, maybe, I don't, you know, and I can't explain why, whether he just thought it was right for me or 
or he didn't see anybody else that he thought would be right in it. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't the first time that, that he would cancel a ballot because the, the dancer that right. knew it um, was injured. Yeah, nowadays we do multiple casts, so we're always ready in case these sorts of things happen. Um, and I think that sort of led to a lot of different experiences for you. Rubies, you learned the day of. Yeah. Swan Lake, you learned days before. Yeah. Theme and variations, you had just a week. Uh, I mean, we, yeah, I mean. We, we talk about learning something in a week, okay. But then we usually let it marinate for uh -huh. a few weeks before <laughs> you're in front of the public. But to, to learn something in a week and then be thrown out there, right. I it, can only imagine. Oh, yeah. And I was young, you know, theme. I, I, and also, I was really injured when I did theme, my first theme. And my partner was injured. And he was a principal, and I was a court of ballet. And I wasn't used to being part. And theme is hard, you know? It's hard. And I needed to rehearse, and he was injured. He didn't want to lift me. He didn't want to dance with me. <laughs> uh, it, was not the, it was not the most stellar performance <laughs> early on. But, um, no, but I'm sure, I'm sure you learned a lot from those types But I types did, of and, and having those situations, you, you know, you learn to, you learn, to learn quickly, right. learn the steps quickly, and, and all that, you know, fortunately, classes prepare you for his, his classes, prepared you for his ballets, right. and all that, all that kind of intricate footwork and stuff, we did in class all the time, so it wasn't new, you know, right. it was just hard. <laughs> So in the early 80s, um, Balanchine's health started to deteriorate, unfortunately, and eventually he passed away in 1983. Um, I can only imagine what that must have been like, working so closely with one man and having an organization really led by and created and by one individual. Um, could you speak a little bit about how that affected the company, you and personally, but also the company on the whole? Well, it was, it was devastating to all of us, really. We all felt leaderless, kind of, um, I mean, I kept expecting him to come around the corner. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe he wasn't going to come. Yeah. Um, and I personally felt, well, I have to try and maintain all those standards that he instilled in me and be, set the example for the younger dancers and, you know, really try and, try and pass on and maintain, maintain the standard, maintain the technique, maintain, you know, I tried to help people, I tried to, to set a good example in everything I did in the rehearsal studio or class or on stage, I tried to be a good example. Mm -hmm. um, but inevitably, you know, there, there are, he used to say, if he went away for two days, he could see the difference in our dancing. And if he went away for a week, other people started. Few other people started. And if he was away more than that, everybody saw the difference. Well, he was really away, and right. things started changing. And you know, the company was led a different way, and you know, it it changed. It changed, and it changed slowly. And people, uh, I think there was a, you know, the older dancers tried to kind of keep keep things. We tried to keep it the way it was, which is impossible. Right. It's impossible. Um, but it was a very difficult, it was a difficult time. And there were certain times when I would be given a ballet to do of his that I had never done before. And I thought, if I could just ask him about two questions, they would all kind of fall into place, mm -hmm. but I really don't know what to do here. You know, it was really, I really wanted that, that guidance. It was important, but it wasn't there. I'm sure. In, um, in 1984, you wrote an autobiography, which was called Dancing for Balanchine. Um, I know there's some students out there. I highly recommend this book for students and p young professionals because you, in writing this book, you put a lot of lessons into the book, which I think is very admirable. Rather than a book about your achievements, I found the book was about your struggles and how you overcame them. Um, what made you want to write this book? And uh, sort of, I think you were still dancing at the time. I was still dancing. I didn't want to write this book. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to write this book. Um, there had been a friend of mine who was in publishing who kept saying, you should write a book, Meryl. I said, okay, I don't want to write a book. I don't have time to write a book. I'm right. busy. And so finally, somehow, um, he convinced a publisher that, that I should write a book, <laughs> or a book should be written about me. And we, 
he, they talked to me and we found a writer and, you know, and the writer started and I really thought the writer did not do a good job. And I thought, I can do a better job. I don't write, but I think I could write this first chapter better than this. And so I started and my husband looked at it and he, you know, he kind of edited it and he, well, you need to rewrite this and then he'd kind of make, we started working on it together and we created this first chapter and the editor said, keep going, it's good, keep going. <laughs> and that's how it came about. Right. And then they said that they wanted it to be the first book out after Balanchine died, which meant we really had to get moving right. on it. So we wrote, the, wrote, actually wrote it within six months, which if you're, if there are any writers here, <laughs> you know that's, that's really <laughs> that's fast. <quick>. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was, it was hard. And yeah. I, I'm really glad I did it, but I don't want to do it again. That's it's killing, yeah, you can, killing I mean, effort. You can tell when reading it that all your experiences and memories are very fresh in your mind because there's a lot of quotations of Balanchine and there's lots of in the studio experiences that you share, which are very nice and informative, I think. Um, also, you did something else in 1995. You co were the co-author and co-director of something called The Balanchine Essays? The Balanchine Essays. Um, when Balanchine died, Suki Shore and I, who, Suki is a teacher at the school, and she had been a principal dancer in City Valley. And uh, she and I were talking, and uh, we said, we can't let this technique go. All these details are, right. you know, they need to be preserved. And so we, we said we should we started talking about what to do, and the Balanchine Essays basically was our effort to try and record everything that we knew about all the specifics about the technique. And then that was kind of a dry, boring approach. <laughs> um, so what we ended up doing was showing excerpts of some of his ballets that used, you know, if you talk about arabesque and all the varieties of arabesque and on balance and off balance and, um, you know, the, all the types of steps that are used in it. We took ballets, excerpts from his ballets and did that to show you how he incorporated all these variety of steps right. in his ballets so that it's, you see the application of, of the technique. Yeah, give it um, context. You know, and actually, right, it took forever for them to be finished and then finally more money to raise to be edited and then there was a contract and they couldn't be put out. Just recently, um, they wrote to me and said, uh, they're available actually for nonprofit organizations, libraries, things like that, but now they're gonna try and do them commercially. And very soon, I can't tell you when, they're gonna try and put two out on amazon.com. That's great. Uh, and one is gonna be the bar, and one is gonna be all about arabesque. Well, so those, I don't know, I can't tell you when they're coming out, but. Well, I look forward to seeing that. In the future. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in 1997, after a 31-year career with New York City Ballet, you retired. Um, what was that like? I mean, that was, that's a long time to dance with a, a professional company. Yeah, it was. And I, I had a lot of hip trouble at the end, and I was, I could, my repertoire was kind of restricted to things that didn't need extensions up here. Um, but, and it was a struggle. It was a real struggle but I, I just loved what I did, and I didn't want to quit, and I feel like those last couple years, few years, because I had a two-year period, I didn't dance, and then I came back, and those last years, I treasure those last years. I think there was something about, um, first of all, I felt like I understood all the ballets better, mm -hmm. what, what was really the essence of it, and it wasn't technique, it was something else. Um, and also because I wasn't dancing every night, each performance, you know, I would build up to it and prepare, get my body going and prepare and just focus on that one performance that week. And I just savored it. I just, and some of the performances I remember the most are those. Are those. Really? Yeah, it was, um, and as, as restricted as I was in certain ways, it was just so special to be out on stage. And leaving, it was just crushing to, to have to retire. We just, and yet it had been unbelievably stressful trying to keep my body going, and um, I, I was going to extremes 
in terms of treatment and everything to try and stay dancing. It was time. It was time right. to quit. But um, did you always know that from there you wanted to stage ballets and coach Balanchine's work? Or? I knew <clears throat> that I wanted to stay in ballet. I knew that I wanted to try and pass on Balanchine's leg, you know, whatever he had taught me. Right. And whether that was going to be teaching or coaching or staging ballets or lecturing, or I didn't really know. Um, I thought probably teaching was probably going to be, you know, because I feel uh, I have this, I don't know what it is about me, but to try and work with the corps de ballet, I feel really inept. I'm fine with the principles. Give me some soloists, I'm fine, I'm happy. But to remember which count, which arm, and the pattern, and for the whole corps de ballet, I just, my brain just goes, don't, you don't want to do this, <laughs> Meryl. And so I, I have kind of restricted myself, except for Bala, which I staged in its entirety, um, to, to working with the principals right. or the soloists. <clears throat> and that reduces the ballets I stage because people can't always bring in two people to, to work on a ballet. So, um, but as it's turned out, I'm, I'm starting to, to do more staging. I mean, this, I've, recently I've done quite a bit of staging. Um, <clears throat> well, as we bring the evening to an end, I, I sort of like to talk about um, what brings you to Houston? Uh, you're staging, staging of well, ballet I'm imperial. Well, I'm not staging it. Oh, you guys me. learned the steps. Excuse me. Yes, Vicky Simon here. was recently <laughs> here um, and staged ballet imperial, and now you are here to work with the company and, and add some of Balanchine's flavors and spices. Could you um, talk a little bit about the ballet and also it's has another name. Could you explain that yes, for us? Yes, this, this is a ballet that Balanchine choreographed in the 40s. It was called Ballet Imperial, and it was meant to be a tribute to Petit Pa and his Russian heritage. And it's a big ballet, big corps de ballet, and, and, and very grand, um, you know, the principles are, are like Russian royalty. And uh, originally, the pas de deux in the second movement had a big pantomime, I love you, and you are the sun to me, and he, he, he saw it, I thought, this is too old fashioned, I don't want this anymore. And so in 19, I don't know what year it was, 73, I think, he revived the ballet and he took it out of tutus and he put it in chiffon skirts and he re-choreographed the second movement and then he decided and took away the scenery which had been a, a scene of St. Petersburg, the skyline, you right. know, all the steeples and everything. So he took away the scenery, he took away the costume, he took it, and, it, and he said, okay, now I'm just gonna call it what the music is, Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto Number no. 2. Um, a lot of people were offended that he took it out of tutus. A lot of the other companies and audience members and everything. So a lot of companies that do the ballet, now they wanna do the ballet, but they prefer to do it in tutus. Right. So when they do it in tutus, <coughs> they tend to call it Ballet Imperial. So that's so sort of original. that ex explanation. Um, ballet Imperial was one of the first ballets I did in the core. The solos role was one of the first solos I ever did. And the principal I did when I was in the core de ballet, it was my big break. It was my huge break. And um, so I know the ballet pretty well. <laughs> um, and I think it's what, it was one of my most favorite things to do. It's one of the most challenging. and. The first solo is just terrifying. You're so exposed and you're doing things that everybody can see. You don't have to be experienced to know if you're kind of wobbly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really, uh, really nerve-wracking, but it's just glorious to dance. And the music is, oh, it just makes your heart soar and melt and, I don't know, it's really uplifting music. Well, I look forward to the premiere. Well, Meryl, thank you so much. Thank for you. Thank this. you. All. It's been a real pleasure and honor. Thank you.